Okay, um, so hello everyone. Um, we're gonna be talking about uh, artificial intelligence and genetics and genomic medicine today. Um, and um, I'm gonna be presenting this lecture. My name is Asan uh, and I'm an MD PhD student. I'm doing my PhD in genetics uh, and I'm also the co-president for the AI in Medicine Student Society this year. Um, so this kind of ties well with um, what I'm doing in genetics and also with, um, with AI. Um, and my email is right there. So if you have any questions, um, you can always email me uh, about that. Okay, there's a lot to get through today. So I'm gonna try and uh, be a little concise and maybe a little quick. Um, so we are gonna have a brief review of uh, and the history of, of genetics and genomics. Uh, and we're gonna talk about um, AI and machine learning in general a little bit. And this um, is more of a brief review because um, obviously, the idea is you've had the chance to go through uh, some of the other lectures within the uh, curriculum that actually have gone through the basics of AI and machine learning. Um, and we'll talk about the applications of artificial intelligence and genetics and genomics, and then some of the challenges facing the field as well after that. Um, so just a, a brief overview of the field. So uh, genetics and genomics. Um, genetics basically is the study of, of genes, heredity, and the role of genetic variations in biological organisms. Um, and uh, the field of genetics, uh, uh, the mainstay techniques in, in the field of genetics are molecular techniques, uh, but we're mo moving more so towards the omics and the genomics, um, which is basically a data-driven science, and um, it includes a lot of complex data sets and their interactions. Um, and basically they're characterizing the relationship between uh, a genotype of an individual or an organism and their phenotype. Um, and it's also used to uh, look at disease biomarkers, um, look at and identify uh, different coding and non-coding regions of, of the DNA, functions of genes, and also um, how disease causing or deleterious a specific variant or mutation um, in an organism is. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of that. And in terms of uh, the business market, so the global genomic market um, was at 16.4 billion US dollars um, back in 2018. Um, it's hard to realize that that was four years ago, um, but it's expected to actually reach 41.2 billion US dollars in 2025, uh, which is in about three years. So we're kind of in that uh, middle phase between the two. Uh, it's, it's actually expected that Sometime in the 2030s, um, we're going to be able to um, screen everyone's genome, um, and once that actually happens, a lot of things would um, would change. So, for example, dating, reproduction, newborn screening, these are some of the things that are not going to be the same anymore. Um, so, um, and obviously, this is if we actually end up convincing people that vaccines work. Um, that's that's one of the issues that we're going to have to get through, but. Um, once we get there, so for example, assume that two people have um, a mutation on a, at a specific gene, let's say CFTR, which causes the uh, a mutation and which causes um, the cystic fibrosis disease. Uh, so if you have two individuals who have a CFTR mutation and they want to have um, a baby together, um, then they might have to think about whether their, their baby is going to have um, that mutation as well or not. So um, for example, through gene editing or something like that, we might be able to um, avoid something like that. Um, and then the prospects of gene therapy, gene editing, and also choosing the best um, course of action for treatment, therapy, medications, um, things like that based on uh, a patient's genetic makeup is going to be huge. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of ethical challenges um, that might arise with these. So things that relate to eugenics, for example, um, and even in terms of um, disability ethics and things like that, um, we are going to have to deal with those as well as we um, go about doing these. But these are some of the things that are um, that the um, the prospects are, are really huge about. Um, I have this. I've actually gotten this slide of uh, on a from a paper that has specifically talked about whole exome sequencing, um, which is basically sequences the um, all of the exonic parts of of the genome or the coding parts of the genome. Um, but this kind of affects every, every other genomic um, science as well. So just to give an overview, so they talk about 10 Vs 
um, of big data in whole exome sequencing. Um, so for example, one of the things about um, whole exome sequencing here that they talk about is variety. So um, who basically had, uh, sorry, how um, you actually access this data. So you have the accuracy, you have the coverage of that data um, and um, why you're doing it. So is it diseased versus healthy? Are you, and who you're doing it? So um, for example, you have gender, um, age, ethnicity, and some of the other demographic information. This is specifically, again, is about whole exome sequencing, but it could be any, any gen genomic um, uh, technique. Um, when are you doing it? A specific day, month, and year. Um, and then what are you, where are you doing it at? So like the organ and the tissue, the cell. Um, they also talk about the veracity. So how much trustable the data uh, you have from uh, whole exome sequencing is. So there is um, confounding factors. There is uh, mismapped short reads. Um, and then you might over even have uneven coverage of sequence reads as well. Uh, there's a lot of variability within, within the data. So uh, it comes from different data types and sources. Uh, you might have some anomalies and outliers and inconsistent speeds in data loading. Um, so these are all gonna affect um, how you look at the data and how you analyze the data afterwards as well. Um, we, they talk about validity, uh, how accurate the computational pipelines are. For example, a lot of um, studies that you look at, they might um, use an in-house software. They have developed it themselves, um, or even if the, if the software is not in-house, most often the pipelines are in-house. Um, so those, those, are, um, those make it really hard for um, different uh, pipelines to be com compared to each other. Um, <clears throat> they, they talk about vulnerability, privacy and data breaches and security are, are important. Um, so for example, if um, let's say an insurance company has access to um, your, your genetic uh, or, or genomic data, basically, um, are they able to uh, reject a specific life insurance um, based on what you might be uh, at risk for? Um, so for example, we can't have that in Canada because we have uh, rules for that, but uh, some of the other countries, that's a possibility. Um, they talk about volatility, um, whether, uh, like how long the whole exome sequencing data is gonna be considered um, uh, actually relevant and when it's gonna, it's gonna be considered irrelevant and obsolete. Um, they talk about visualization, how challenging is it to visualize it? And if you look at different papers, they have different ways of visualizing the same data. Um, it makes it a little harder to compare and contrast. Um, and also when you're visualizing, you also have the hardware and software limitations as well. Uh, volume of the data is important. Uh, so if you wanna have a full coverage of whole exome sequencing, you're gonna need about five to six gigabytes of, um, of data in BAM format. Um, so, and, and that, can get, that can get really, really huge um, if, if you start doing this in, a, in multiple patients at multiple different points of time. Um, the value, so it can improve health outcomes. Um, if you if you do the genomic data, and like I said, again, they talk specifically about whole exome sequencing here, but gen, gen, generally with genomics, you're improving health outcomes. Um, and then the velocity or the speed at which you can actually do this. So an exome can be sequenced every five minutes. That's a pretty good speed, um, but we can still be, do better than that. And also this is, like I said, just the exome sequencing part. And if you wanna do genome sequencing, that's gonna take a little bit longer than that. So that's kind of an overview of the 10 Vs of big data and um, whole exome sequencing. Um, and this is a bit of a, a general overview of, of uh, history of genomics and personalized medicine. Um, so it basically we started somewhere around 1902 um, where we talked about chemical individuality and pharmacogenetics came about in 1959. Um, and then one of the major um, uh, actually points in history was at, in 1977, where we started doing Sanger sequencing, which we still do use for, for specific genotyping um, measures right now. Uh, in 1990, we started the Human Genome Project. 2001, the first time um, we actually had a draft of the human genome. Um, 2002, we, we had a map of, of human genetic variations. Um, and next generation sequencing came about in 2004, which is um, one of the forms that we are still using again. Um, we had some sort of consortium called the Exome Aggregation Consortium or EXAC. Um, and the data, their, their whole exome sequencing data was actually uh, released at that point uh, in 2010. 
Um, and then we started routinely offering uh, whole exome sequencing uh, in clinical settings in 2011. And since then, that's that's been the mainstay of, of a lot of clinical genetics um, in, in medicine. Um, and then just to see here, also the European Commission, United States and China have actually announced a lot of um, different uh, funding frameworks uh, to make sure that they're um, improving and developing precision medicine frameworks um, and infrastructure as well. Um, and then one major thing here is that in 2025, um, we are expected to have one to 17 petabytes of data per year from Twitter, um, one exabytes per year of data from astronomy, one to two exabytes per year of data from YouTube, and then compare all of that to genomics um, which we expect to have two to 40 exabytes per year of data. Um, and exabytes are basically um, a thousand petabytes, which is a million terabytes, which is a billion gigabytes. That is an astronomical number in terms of, um, in terms of the data. And then if you also look at this figure here, um, so basically going from genetic medicine that paves the way for personalized medicine to um, whole exome sequencing to big data and analytics, um, genomic information, um, and clinical applications of those, and then the rise of AI in, in, in genetics and genomics, which is what we are going to be talking about today. So just to briefly review AI and machine learning that we've, we've seen in previous courses, uh, or previous lectures of the course, rather. Um, so AI, or artificial intelligence, basically tries to simulate human intelligence, um, and the idea is to learn, reason, solve, and take some sort of an action. Uh, machine learning is an approach to achieve AI, um, and deep learning is a branch of machine learning um, or so, uh, a group of algorithms within machine learning that are used to um, achieve AI as well. Um, so in brief, so here is, a, is, is an example of a supervised uh, um, learning algorithm. And uh, again, you, you've already seen the, uh, the difference between supervised and unsupervised, but here, for example, you have a somatic sequence um, variants of a cancer cell line, um, and you want to see, you want to use the properties of a drug that you want to use against it, and basically look at those two and see how how viable the cell, cell line is going to be when when they're exposed to that drug. Um, and so you you actually label that before you know how viable a specific cell line is to that drug uh, after they're exposed to that drug, and then um, the the basically what happens is the um, algorithm is going to get that raw data, is going to pre-process it. You're going to end up with a clean sort of um, set of data here. Uh, you're going to extract some, uh, the software is going to extract some features. Um, these features are going to get used in training, which is the part that the label comes into play as well. And then your model is going to um, distinguish between different, um, different labels and different raw data um, this way. And then it's going to evaluate and give you, give you some sort of a result. And the whole idea is once you give this algorithm a new cell line, uh, it can predict the survival of that cell line if a specific drug is used against it. Um, so some of the um, examples of supervised learning algorithms are linear regression, logistic regression, random forest, and, um, and SVM, support vector machines. There are also unsupervised methods where you are not basically labeling your data. Um, so it's supposed to basically discover the patterns from your data by itself. And some of the examples of those are principal component analysis, factor analysis, clustering, and outlier detection. Uh, and so, for example, in this case here, um, in an unsupervised learning model, you, you give it some sort of data, it does some sort of feature extraction, um, and it just gives you a, a sense of, um, based on a discriminative feature, basically, it's, it discriminates between the two. In this case, for example, it's discriminated between introns um, and exons. Um, and this is a deep learning network here. So you give it some sort of a raw data initially, let's say a sequence of, of uh, a, let's say a genetic sequence, um, goes through a first layer and does some sort of um, pre-processing. And then within the deeper layer in layer two, it comes up with those labels of, for example, this is a transcription start site, this is an intron, this is an exon, and then it just gives you the label at the end. Um, there are a lot of different um, algorithms that machine learning uses, especially in, in uh, genetics. We have, um, if, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the papers, there are, there are deep neural networks, there are convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, graph convolutional neural networks. Um, there are variational autoencoders and also generative uh, adversarial networks can, that can um, make those like fake images and, and videos that you've probably seen 
um, before, but they're also used in, in making new data, um, especially because you need a lot of data to, to train a lot of these techniques. Um, and you can easily um, basically make that data through uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks. Um, so briefly, in terms of uh, AI and machine learning in, in, in genetics, um, so if you look at a lot of the day, a lot of these studies, they date back to the 1970s and 80s, um, and uh, the the initial uh, usage of AI and machine learning in genetics have mostly been uh, developing these knowledge-based systems and and interpretations of um, of different genetic um, components, uh, and then they've also been used to plan genetic and molecular experiments um, in a little bit of a higher um, level there, um, and then they've been used to extract the coding regions of the DNA, and um, and most of it now is used for detection of errors and and variants and mutations, basically such as frame shift mutations and DNA sequences. And if you look at the number of publications. Um, so back in 2010, we had about 300 publications uh, relating to AI and genetics or genomics on PubMed. Uh, that number was up to 2000 um, in 2019. So that's a, that's a pretty big jump in terms of the number of publications and, and studies. Um, so high throughput techniques have actually given us a lot of big data. So as we talked about before, so the draft of the human genome sequence, human genome um, uh, sequence, the first time was completed in um, 20, 2001. Uh, so that was about 20 years ago. Um, and since then, we've actually generated a, a huge amount of data through genomic sequencing. Um, and we have these high throughput techniques now that we use that make it easier to measure multiple variables simultaneously, um, as opposed to some of the traditional techniques that we use that only allow us to measure one variable at the, at the same time. Uh, some of the current applications of AI and machine learning that I'm going to kind of go through uh, real quick today are um, identifying some of the hidden patterns within the human within the genome, um, looking at cancer and, and identifying specific cancer types from biopsies. Usually, it's it's liquid biopsies. Um, predicting the type of cancer a certain individual has a predisposition for has been one of those um, applications of AI in, in genetics, um, and uh, providing more, better and more accurate sequencing results um, and base calling and things like that has been another application. Um, looking at how deleterious or, or disease causing a certain genetic mutation is, um, the identifying the genotype or the genetic syndrome um, by looking at the phenotype of, of an individual um, and also improving gene editing uh, and gene therapy tools. Um, so for example, CRISPR that's used in gene editing uh, is also another um, application of AI and machine learning genetics and genomics. Um, so I've gotten this figure uh, off of a report from the P PhD Foundation, and uh, this kind of summarizes a lot of um, the usages of AI in, 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 in genetics and genomics. Uh, so initially, you have this you have this pathogen, or you have cells, um, and you can again, you can, as it says, like you can do that on a on a specific cell line, or you can do it on a ba on bacteria or or viruses. So you get the DNA sample from them. Um, you, you, you start doing a genome, genome sequencing. So before you can even do genome sequencing, you need to design your primers. AI and machine learning has been used in, in primer design. Um, the sequencing in and of itself might take about, might take a couple hours or a few hours to do. Um, and then once, when, when you're actually doing genome sequencing, the software or the, or the machine that's doing that has to base call. So figure, figure out if this is an A or a C or a T or a G or whatever it's seeing. Um, again, AI and machine learning has been used for, for base calling. Um, in terms of data processing um, and uh, variant calling and basically looking at the assembly of that data, uh, you're going to be variant calling at that point, whether um, this, is, this is a mutation or it's not a mutation. That's also another thing AI and machine learning has been used for, and it takes a, a few hours as well. Once that's done, you also do genome annotation. So what part of the genome is this? Is this a regulatory element? Is this, a, is this an enhancer, a promoter region, um, or a coding region of the, of the genome? So that's also um, some, some place that AI and machine learning has been used in. Um, and then once you get to analysis and interpretation, this is where you um, predict the effect of whatever variant you have called before. So you're, you're trying to see if um, the, the mutation that you've seen here is disease causing or, or not, and how significant it is. Uh, and this takes days to months to, to actually do if you are doing this manually. So uh, you're gonna have to go through a bunch of databases, look at the previous literature, 
um, what has been reported before in different animal studies and human studies, um, and kind of come up with, uh, with some sort of prediction for whatever variant you're seeing in this case. Uh, and if no one has actually done this before, and no one has seen that specific allele that you're seeing, or that specific mutation that you're seeing, then good luck to you, because there's, there's really not really anything you can do at that point um, to, to figure out if that is deleterious or not. And then once, that, once that's done, uh, you can use these in two uh, separate streams, I guess. So one of them would be in, in research, uh, when you're reporting and informing the literature, one of them would be in the clinical interpretation. So um, obviously in clinical interpretation, you have time-sensitive analysis. If someone comes in with critical illness, you need to figure this out really quickly. Um, you're gonna need to report the test results um, and you're gonna have to do genetic counseling and then come up with some sort of treatment for that. So AI and machine learning has been used in these ones and we're gonna review some of these as well. And in terms of uh, the research part of things, uh, the uh, AI and machine learning has been used to, to basically come up with polygenic risk scores um, in terms of drug discovery, uh, any sort of microbiome studies, um, multi-omics analysis. So like if you're like looking at transcriptomics or RNA sequencing data, um, proteomics like mass spectrometry and things like that, then you're gonna, um, um, then you're gonna actually um, use AI and machine learning for this as well. Um, there's also a cancer evolution uh, modeling that has been uh, done using AI and machine learning and research, metagenomics, population genetics, and also mining the literature to figure out if this has been done before is another um, aspect of, of using AI and machine, uh, and machine learning in genetics and genomics. Okay, so let's do this rapid fire move through some of these um, um, applications of AI and machine learning in genetics and genomics. So one of these is, is base calling, as we talked about. So one, when you're doing sequencing um, or genotyping, there are, there are different sequencing methods that you use for that. Um, so like I said, there is Sanger sequencing, there's next-gen sequencing, and uh, very recently we have the long-read sequencing. Um, one of the devices that's used for long-read sequencing is the Oxford uh, Nanopore. Um, and basically what it does is you have this strand of DNA or RNA that runs through it, and then it, it runs a current, an electrical current through that. And then based on that electric, the, the res response of the electrical current, it can actually call the base. So for example, in this case, this threshold here, um, if the current is around this threshold here, it's, that's a G, this threshold is A, this is T, this is C. So um, it, the, the base calling, though, one of the major uh, issues with that is it can be really, really inaccurate and can be problematic if you have a specific point mutation. So let's just assume here that um, I'm looking at this T versus this G. As you can see, they're pretty close together in terms of the current measurements. If you have a little bit of an outlier here, there's a very high chance that the device is going to make a mistake and call a T a, T, a G or a G a T. Um, so depending on where that is and, and uh, which codon it, it ends up with and what sort of mutation that might cause, um, it's possible that you either have a point mutation there um, and, the, um, and the sequencing results is going to be normal, or it might, it might be that it is actually normal, but the sequencing results would show that there is some sort of point mutation there. So this, this becomes really important to, to make sure that you're, you're actually calling the bases as they are. Um, so one of these uh, methods that uses AI and machine learning to, um, to actually figure out what the specific base is, is called this, is this algorithm called causal call. Um, so what it does is you have these uh, measurements and then it goes through um, a, a, an algorithm and it comes, it comes up with a batch of, of these uh, sequences that have some, some things in common um, but it's kind of like a sliding window of the same of the same sequence. That's that's the input that's given to a modified temporal convolutional neural network, um, and then this uh, temporal convolutional neural network um, basically maps the current measurements to a probability distribution, as you can see here. Um, and this probability distribution goes through a connectionist temporal classification decoder, is what they've called it. Um, and then this decoder is basically the one that calls whatever um, that base could be. Now, the thing that comes out again is a batch of these sequences. Now, the good thing about this is if you have an error somewhere and one of these probability distributions is a little bit different. So let's say the T we're looking at here, uh, one of these batches comes up and, and calls this a G, but the rest of it calls, it, calls this a T. On average, you have more T than G. So you decide that that's a T rather than a G. Um, so it, it kind of uh, tries to make sure that you're doing this a little bit more accurately than 
um, if it was just the normal uh, strand initially. Um, and so, for example, Oxford Nanopore in and of itself has multiple um, um, multiple uh, softwares that they use or, or algorithms that they use. Uh, so initially they used Albacore, which is discontinued now, um, and then Guppy, which I believe is also discontinued. And then they they used Scrappy after, and now it's Flappy, which has replaced Scrappy, which is, it's actually funny how they've named these um, algorithms. Uh, but there's also third party, there are also third party algorithms like Chiron, NanoNet, Deep Nano, and, and Base, uh, Base Crawler um, that can be used with the Oxford uh, Nanopore. Um, another thing that AI is used a lot in genetics and genomics is a variant prediction. As we talked before, um, doing variant prediction manually takes up to months of work. So you have to go through databases uh, such as OMIM, gene cards, ClinVar, um, and there are also species specific databases like for zebrafish, we have Zfin, for, for mice, we have JAX, for um, fruit flies and Drosophila, we have Flybase. And there are so many other specific databases for for species for different species. Um, so you might have to go through all of these databases to figure out if whatever whatever sort of mutation you're seeing is present in any other diseases before and has been reported as um, as, as deleterious before. Um, but now AI comes in with a lot of uh, actually algorithms that are based on, on convolutional neural networks or deep learning algorithms. Um, and there are some that are actually combined, um, that have actually combined these two to come up with, with better um, variant prediction. So I'll start with ClinVar. Um, as I said, this is basically a database as, and, and how the website also um, talks about it is just a public archive of reports of the relationships um, among the human variations and phenotypes with supporting evidence. Um, so for example, I just did like FOXC1 is one of the genes I, I work on. Um, so I just did a search for FOXC1. And as you can see here, for example, it says they've seen it in axenfeld weiger syndrome type three before. Um, and they have reported that that's pathogenic. And um, they also talk about how, how much of a um, reliable uh, re reliability the evidence for it has. Um, and they also talk about which mutation and where the mutation is and all of that stuff as well. Um, and sometimes, the, the, the results here are not as clear cut. So this one says pathogenic for all three of these. This is great. Now I know this might be pathogenic, but for example, this one has is saying conflicting interpretations of pathogenicity. So this is pretty controversial at this point. You can't really call it um, pathogenic, whether it's pathogenic and disease causing or it isn't. Um, so um, this is maintained by the National Institute of Health. It's a pretty good database, uh, but going through this is, is, is really a pain. And, and I only have these like four um, entries here, but there is multiple hundred, thousand, hundred to thousands of, of, um, of these entries when you actually search for a specific gene. So trying to go through all of that, and this is just one database, um, but trying to go through all of that in different databases is really, really time consuming. Um, so one of the things that have been used for this is they've they've this the, this paper for example they've actually used convolutional and deep neural networks um, to predict var uh, variants here. So one of the things they have done and this is this is a little bit different from what we were used to before is first of all we would usually look at between individual variations. So we would look at let's say here we have three individuals we would look at the difference between these three individuals. Um, this algorithm here has also incorporated within individual variations. So you have this sliding window that we just saw in another algorithm before, you have the sliding window that goes on different locus, lo loci, um, and then it, it, it kind of um, um, does a sampling of, of, that, um, of that locus and then feeds that into, um, into a convolutional neural network here. So this convolutional neural network, you, went, you go through uh, multiple layers of, um, of networks and at the end, your output layer is going to come off, uh, come out with um, some sort of uh, some sort of a result that that you can actually use later for uh, your deep uh, deep learning uh, neural network. And, and so, what it does is, let's say you actually do this for a wild type uh, or or normal individual, and you do this for for some um, for for an individual or an organism that has a mutation in it. Um, you get two different responses out of the convolutional neural network that gets fed into a deep neural network. And then um, at the end, you get a variant score. 
And this variant score basically is going to tell you how um, deleterious or what, what's the probability of this being, um, being deleterious. And for example, in this case is a 0 0.9. 0 0.9 would be considered deleterious. Um, if it was 0 0.5, we would have considered that normal. And if it goes above um, a certain threshold, um, then we'd consider that deleterious. So 0 0.9 is pretty much um, deleterious here. Um, and so one of the issues with machine learning in general is that it's pretty data hungry. So you need a lot of data to feed into it um, for it to actually work well. Um, so rare diseases, for example, are really hard to predict in this case. But one of the things that this specific algorithm um, has, which is a good feature, is that it actually looks at the within, at, at within individual variation. And so that's a little bit more data that you're giving to the algorithm that helps um, train a better, better algorithm than it normally would have. So some other examples of, of, of this are combined annotation dependent depletion or CAD, which is an open source online uh, platform that you can use for this. Um, it's based on a linear kernel support vector machine. So it's a supervised learning um, algorithm. Um, and um, it, it actually considers the non-coding regions of, of, the, of the DNA as well, because some of the mutations and variations could actually happen within the non-coding region. Uh, now, one of the issues with uh, CAD is that it only considers um, or learns from linear representations of the data. Um, so um, some researchers, they came up with DAN, which is the deleterious annotation of genetic variants using neural networks. Um, and again, this is also um, an open source algorithm. You can uh, get it from GitHub um, and it's, it works on um, Python basically. Uh, and it uses deep networks to add some sort of abstraction. So it's not just a linear representation of the data, but it can actually uh, accept more abstract data as well. Um, DeepBind here is another algorithm that has been used before. So for example, you get these high throughput, you do these high, high throughput experiments like the uh, protein binding microarrays or systemic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. Um, or you do chromatin immunoprecipitation, cross-linking immunoprecipitation, um, which are going to tell you the DNA and RNA um, interactions with, with the proteins uh, or any sort of RNA modifications. And so you end up with this large-scale data set at the end uh, that you give to, to the, to the DeepBind algorithm, which uses GPUs or graphical processing units um, to come up with some sort of a model. Now, this model is, is going to be automatically trained, and now you can give it new motifs, which are these... Um, regulatory regions um, within, within the genome, and, and the network can actually predict at the end what exactly these um, motifs are, are, are interacting with uh, and what sort of proteins um, or RNA modifications or um, RNA protein interactions are being done there. Um, and so this can actually be used in, in gene regulation, in precision medicine, and also detecting um, what binding sites the genome has as well. Um, deep variant is another algorithm. Uh, this is made by Google, and this is a convolutional neural network to basically identify um, <clears throat> the single nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, um, and, which are basically we consider them normal um, variations within the genome, um, and also the small insertion and deletion mutations um, within the genome as well. And so, how it works is that you have this reads initially that that are aligned to a reference genome. Um, they, they find these candidate variants and, and encode it into pileup images rather than just feeding the sequence itself in. Um, these pileup images are, get, are, are given to the train, tested, um, or rather, sorry, trained convolutional neural network. Um, and the deep learning model basically comes up with likelihood of, of a variant being deleterious or not. Um, and how they, this is how the convolutional neural network has been trained. So you have the labeled training pairs that are the, these pileup images. Uh, you have known genotypes, and then you actually have a starting convolutional neural network that could either be just a uh, just an empty network, or it could be a transfer learning. So it's already learned some sort of image classification before, um, and then it's it's being used and transferred here. And then it goes through a training cycle of of um, stochastic gradient descent, and then in the end you have this trained convolutional neural network um, that's going to do uh, do the work. And so this is this is an example here. Um, you, you have these pileup images and they are actually color coded for specific, um, for specific nucleotides. Uh, it goes through the convolution neural network and in the end it basically gives you a, um, um, a number which uh, corresponds to a specific um, variant call. So in this case, for example, this is uh, considered to be hit 
meaning heterozygous variant call. So this is heterozygous for the reference genome. So one of the alleles is, is similar to the reference genome. The other one is a mutation. Um, it could also be homozygous reference, uh, which means that both alleles are, are the same as the reference genome, or it could be homozygous alternative, which means that both um, the alleles are different from the reference genome. Um, so this is, like I said, a Google-based um, de um, deep neural network or a deep convolutional neural network. Um, Expecto is another algorithm that's a little bit complicated, um, but it ends up basically giving you the human disease and trait insights. Um, and it has these three components um, in here. So it, there's the deep convolutional uh, neural network um, the, that, that, that's basically trained on chromatin profiling data, um, and it's going to convert uh, sequences to regulatory features. There's this spatial feature transformation uh, module, and then uh, there's also these uh, this linear model that predicts gene expression from uh, nonlinear regulatory representations here. And as you can see, we've we've gone over to to the nonlinear side for a while now, um, and so like we're we're actually um, predicting these variations or mutations on on a on a nonlinear basis rather than assuming that they are linear, which they aren't. <laughs> Um, primate AI is also another algorithm that's been used. Uh, this is actually an interesting algorithm that they have used. It's, uh, it basically gives, at the end, it basically gives you a range from zero to one. Um, zero is benign um, and one is basically pathogenic. Uh, and what they do is they use 99 vertebrate species um, um, or, or geno genomes from 99 verte vertebrate species um, and also the reference human genome and the alternate human genome as an input. And then it basically gives you this protein secondary structure and the solvent accessibility states. Um, and, um, and this is, I can uh, just quickly go over, go over, go over this, this part of the image here. Um, so ClinVar, as we talked about, uh, is gonna give you some pathogenic variants. So for example, in this case, they've looked at this specific uh, genomic sequence so you have these areas where ClinVar has um, has data on where uh, that are that are pathogenic. There's also the exact um, variants in healthy individuals. So obviously, where there's more blue, there's more healthy um, healthy variations. And as you can see, for example, here where there is a lot of healthy variation and not really a, a pathogenic variation, pri primate AI um, is pretty close to zero. The the, the result of primate AI, primate AI is pretty close to zero, meaning there's um, this is not really pathogenic, as opposed to, for example, if you look here, um, there's not really a healthy individual um, genotype here, uh, but there's a lot of pathogenic variants from the from ClinVar, and as you can see, this is again pretty close to one, um, so that could that could come up as as pathogenic. Um, as I mentioned before, so whole exome sequencing has been used a lot in, in, in clinical uh, medicine. Uh, whole genome sequencing is also being used as well. Now, whole genome sequencing um, can be contrasted with whole exome sequencing uh, in the sense that whole exome sequencing has less data. Um, it's obviously faster since it has less data, but it's also less accurate in terms of diagnosis. So whole genome sequencing is going to be um, preferred over that if we want more accurate diagnoses. The only problem is it's going to take a long time. Now you can use something called the rapid whole genome sequencing methods. Um, you're gonna have the same amount of data. You, you're gonna have more automated processing though. And so that's gonna result in faster diagnoses. <clears throat> so this is a pipeline from uh, the Rady Institute that they've used. Uh, and, and, and this is pretty, um, 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 pretty interesting that they've done this. So they, they're comparing and contrasting a manual uh, normal whole genome sequencing with a rapid whole genome sequencing that's that's uh, done mostly by a pipeline based on AI. Um, so what they do here is initially, so if you're doing this manually, you're going to be ordering uh, genome sequencing manually, you're going to get a blood sample, you're going to extract that DNA, do a quality analysis and normalize it, send it for sequencing, that's, uh, or, ra or rather prepare it for sequencing, uh, normalize it again, you're going to send it for sequencing, um, the sequence is going to align it to, to the reference um, sequence, and then you're going to call the variant. While that is happening, you're going to review the electronic health, health records and, for, and extract the phenotypes, and then you're going to translate that to, to human phenotype ontology terms. Um, and then all of these are going to come together to, for you to interpret provisional diagnoses. And most of this is done by clinical staff, like uh, medical geneticists, for example, doctors who are, who are, who are uh, specialists in genetics and genomics. 
Um, they're going to do a literature review and diagnostic report um, within the electronic health records, and then that's in, that's that's going to end up with some sort of a precision medicine um, diagnosis. Now this takes a minimum of 26 hours to be done for just one um, person, and the mean time to diagnosis is 16 days. That's a very long time, if especially if someone shows up with a critically with a critical illness. So they actually tested their algorithm in in the ICU. Um, for infants that, that present with critical illnesses. So what they did was um, the rapid genome sequencing was ordered in, in, in electronic health records. So this was not done manually. They had the blood or, or dried blood spot sample. Um, and then they also came up with this uh, clinical natural language processing algorithm um, that goes through the electronic health records and it automatically translates to, um, to the human phenotype ontology. Now, the blood sample that they had, they actually prepared it, again, automatically. The quality assurance was done automatically. Sequence was, sequencing was done automatically. Alignment and variant calling and genotyping was also done automatically. Uh, as you can see, this is a version one, this is a version two, and that's the, that's the difference between the two. Um, so once this clinical natural language processing algorithm results and the variant calling results are, are available, um, they used an automated provisional um, diagnosis algorithm and the literature review and diagnosis report in EHR was also done automatically and then they come up they they basically have this rapid precision medicine at the end this takes about a, a minimum of 19 hours um, to diagnose up to six patients concurrently so compare the 16 days from this for one patient to 19 hours with this for six patients at the same time so that's a pretty big difference, and that's that's a lot faster than what you would have done manually. Um, and this is um, a picture of uh, some of those human gene human um, phenotype ontology uh, results that they've looked at. So, for example, if they had a patient that was admitted to the emergency department for poor feeding, uh, ketoneuria, metabolic acidosis, um, basically the the algorithm comes up with these um, the natural language processing uh, algorithm that they have comes up with these. Uh, keywords to search for, so acidosis, metabolic acidosis, ketone urea, and feeding difficulties. Um, and then they go through um, multiple different um, databases like OMIM and, um, and also through the electronic health records. Um, and then they've compared these to, to expert reviews um, and, and also um, the, the manual extractions from OMIM. So for example, here are these um, or blue or teal um, 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 shapes here are uh, extracted from OMIM. Um, the yellow ones are, are phenotypic features that are extracted by both the clinical natural language processing and expert review. Um, the red circles are the manual review that's, um, that's done by EHR, um, that, that's done of, of the EHR and by the um, clinical natural language processing as well. Um, the purple ones here are the overlaps between clinical natural language processing and OMIM, and the gray ones are the location of the parent uh, in terms of those identified um, phenotypes in the hierarchy. So this is a pretty fast pipeline of going through all of that um, to, to, get, to get to diagnosis pretty fast. <clears throat> and then once they have the diagnosis, so genetic counseling is an important aspect of, of, doing, of dealing with genetic disorders. So there are some chatbots, for example, that are, that are made for patients. Um, that are considering genetic testing. So there's, for example, GIA, which is Genetic Information Assistant, uh, that's made by Clear Genetics or Invitae, which we use a lot for, for um, arrays of genes um, as, as, uh, as a company. Uh, GeneFax and Op Optra Guru is also uh, by Optra Health, um, and they are also chatbots that, are help, that, that basically help genetic counselors to provide uh, patients with information about what sort of tests they're going to be doing and what those, those tests are and what their results are going to be. And when they get the results, what, what are those results and what the interpretations are. Uh, genome annotation is another aspect of, of AI in genetics and genomics, as I mentioned initially. Um, and basically, like I said, they're, they're, it's, it's there to identify and classify different components of the genome. So you have the coding areas, enhancers, promoters, transcription start sites, and splice sites. Specifically, the splice sites has been used a lot in, 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 in basically AI has been used a lot to, to figure out those splice sites. So alternative splicing, for example, to figure that out, there's been um, a lot of different um, machine learning based algorithms to, to look at that. For example, there's Splice AI, DeepC, and DanQ. Uh, so Splice AI is a, is a deep learning algorithm that uh, identifies splice variants, uh, like looking at cryptic splice sites and things like that. And it's done by Illumina, which is this giant 
um, genomic company that does a lot of sequencing and stuff as well. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit about DanQ and DeepSeed. We're just going to look at the um, structure of these. So you have this uh, one hot coding um, initial raw data. Uh, you give it to this convolutional network. Um, there is some sort of max pooling that happens after that. And you have these recurrent networks of uh, LSTMs or long short-term memory um, features uh, that go into the, a dense layer um, that extracts some, some um, outputs. And then you, you end up with multitask output and the, at the end. And this is basically going to tell you the alternative splicing sites of, of, um, of these genes. Uh, Deep C is another... Uh, algorithm that has been used for the same thing. So you have the, the, the this is the other thing that DeepSea actually does is it also looks at the effect of variant um, variants in the non-coding region. So it kind of predicts those effects. Um, so what it does is you have this um, genomic sequence and you know the variant position, you feed that into the algorithm that's based on deep con convolutional neural networks. It's been trained on multiple data sets from before. Um, and what it does is basically gonna tell you whether um, what, what the probability of this thing being DHS, which is DNA's um, um, one hypersensitivity site, or TF binding, which is transcription factor binding, or um, histone marks. And then it's going to compare and give you a, a graph at the end. Um, and then the, um, at the end, it's basically going to give you a functional variant um, prediction of, of that variant in the non-coding region. Another thing that's been done with uh, AI and machine, AI and genetics is is phenotype extraction. So this is this is a picture of um, face to gene, uh, which is an app that um, basically uh, takes a picture of the face of some uh, of someone's face um, and basically tells you uh, what sort of uh, genetic syndromes they might have. Um, now, um, in this case, for example, I think that it gives you a, a few top. Um, diagnoses or like a differential diagnosis of some sort, um, and then also gives you a top diagnosis and it also gives you a case analysis. Uh, they've, they've actually expanded the software now, so they, they actually give a lot more information and there's also forums and stuff that, that um, clinicians can actually talk about uh, their patients with each other, um, and they can also share data with, with, between different clinics. This is um, a picture from a paper that I had seen a few um, uh, weeks ago. Um, and this is on actually zebrafish. So they, they've looked at the movements of a, zebra, uh, a zebrafish model that has a uh, mutation um, in DJ1, which is a gene that's associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, and so they're actually showing the, the results of their um, training and, and, and test scores in terms of accuracy um, for, um, for an algorithm that they've used that is actually an evolutionary algorithm, which is based on, on genomic science, interestingly enough. Um, and what they're showing here is in, very interesting that the, the classifiers that have been using raw movement data have higher test scores than classifiers that, uh, that use the extracted features that they've done through principal component analysis. So their algorithm actually works better if you just give it the raw data rather than process it um, initially with something else um, and do that. However, it's like not really a great model because PINK1 is also another gene that's associated with Parkinson's disease. And the average test score for PIG1 is not really great. Um, neither is the one when, when they get it from, from raw movement data. Um, so one of the major things that happens a lot in, in, in AI and genetics and genomics now is combining of multiple data sets. So you have, um, for example, there, there, there is a study that have, uh, have looked at diagnosing low respiratory tract infections like pneumonia. Um, and basically what they do is RNA and DNA sequencing of um, the data from the host and the pathogen. So they look at the bacteria's, the, the bacterium sequence data and also the host sequence data. They also look at the airway microbiome and clinical host response. And all of that goes into an AI algorithm and, and, and that basically comes up with some sort of prognos prognosis or diagnosis. Um, and then multiomics and, and health records have been combined a lot um, within a lot of studies to figure out um, a specific diagnosis or prognosis as well. Uh, this, is, this is pretty much key to precision and personalized medicine. And it can also be used in population genetics and, and estimating polygenic scores, which are really important in, in a lot of diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, because there's not just one disease, one gene that causes these diseases. Um, another aspect that um, AI uh, in genetics and genomics helps out is in pharmacogenomics. 
Um, so basically what pharmacogenomics does is using these genetic biomarkers uh, to treat and, and to also uh, repurpose specific drugs that we, we might have been using before. Um, it looks at the, ver at the the effects of genetic variations or those single nucleotide polymorphisms, for example, on responses of the, of the patients to medications as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so it also, uh, and it also talks about genes involved, looks at basically genes that are involved in absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, or ADME, which is um, a principle of, uh, a major principle in pharmacokinetics. Um, pharmacoepigenomics also is, is a subfield here, and it also considers the non-coding regulatory DNA sequences, uh, and not just the coding um, areas. Um, and some of these differences, as I said, uh, come from the come from single, single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs um, that are mainly in the enhancer and promoter regions, and that's why it's important to 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 look at the non-coding regions. Um, and here I have like an example, which is deep patient that uses a random forest algorithm to to look at disease probability, and it can be used in pharmacogenomics. Um, some of the there there are a lot of challenges within pharmacogenomics, though, and one of the prime examples of that is is the failure of IBM Watson Health's um, oncology AI software, um, which was not really helpful in trying to figure out which one of the drugs would be, would be used, would be better in oncology to be used. Um, and so IBM Watson actually recently just sold uh, their health um, division to a venture capitalist. So um, I don't think they've been doing really well in that sense. Um, precision medicine, we've talked about this a little bit, um, basically brings in a lot of multiple aspects from, from the patient to um, to the um, to their reaction to the drug, um, it looks at age, gender, ethnicity, lifestyle, environmental factors, and biomarkers. A lot of different health determinants, um, and also genetic variations. Um, and it's so multidimensional that the traditional methods that we've we've been using for statistics, for example, cannot really be used uh, to determine the best uh, mode of therapy or treatment for a patient. Uh, machine learning algorithms come in and help with this. For example, in precision psychiatry, we can try and figure out the effectiveness of antidepressants and maybe increase that. Right now, the effectiveness of our antidepressants are really, really low, and we actually go through the whole process on a trial and error basis, which is not um, efficient or effective. Um, and this can even be done in reproductive medicine. So for example, in, in an IVF um, let's say you, you want to do IVF, in vitro fertilization, um, choosing the best time to, to perform that can depend on a lot of different things. This can be something that precision medicine can do. So you can look at the hormone regimens, the follicular growth patterns, and also do a pre-implantation uh, genetic screening and combine all of those data sets together to, to come up with, um, with the best time window to perform the IVF. Uh, cancer genomics uh, has also been using a lot of AI. So we've been combining a lot of data sets, pathology images and molecular biomarkers, and pathology is kind of moving towards molecular genetics as well. Uh, this can be used to diagnose and prognosticate, but there's a lot of challenges. There's large amounts of data uh, and the slides are not easy to digitize. Uh, they're pretty slow and it's also setting specific. There are however algorithms to, that can even digitally stain the, the slide. So you can give it a slide and it, it, it gives you a, a, an image out as if it's been, um, as if it's been digitally stained by, um, like let's say H and E stain. Uh, imaging genetics is another um, place that AI is being used, uh, especially because imaging genetics actually has a lot more data set data, uh, uh, data than just genetics and imaging alone. Especially in genetics itself, the data in genetics is actually much more complicated than the than the data from imaging itself, because imaging. Um, uh, does not have that when you look at the pixels and voxels, um, those do not have those like 3D interactions that are really complicated with their with the other uh, pixels and voxels around them, which is not the case for genetic sequences because they actually have those 3D um, interactions. Um, viral AI is this is this is a new algorithm that I recently saw, uh, or rather uh, more of a um, more of a decentralized data storage system that does a little bit of AI as well. Uh, it's developed by DNA Stack, which is a which is a Canadian company, um, and they use this federated architecture to to make sure that the data is is decentralized and not specifically stored in a uh, central data set data, database. Um, and it's facilitating data sharing to to extract a lot of insights like transmission severity, diagnostics, vac vaccine escape, and all of that stuff in genomic surveillance. Um, and for example, I have included some numbers here from their um, from what they've done for, uh, for COVID specifically or, or SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, and then very last thing um, I wanna talk about before I go into the challenges um, is that AI uh, and machine learning has been used in genome editing um, and, um, and basically doing that a little bit more effectively. So here, for example, this is a study that's been done on CPF1, uh, which is an endonuclease um, protein that allows gene, uh, genome editing in various species and cell types, uh, one of which is the human cells. And basically what this algorithm does is they use this deep convolutional neural network again, um, and then they, they predict the activity of CPF1 in that specific um, sequence and try and figure out if CPF1 would be the best uh, endonuclease to be used with, um, with CRISPR-Cas9 um, or generally CRISPR-Cas systems to edit the genome. Uh, and this is a research from Microsoft Health actually, um, and they've looked at off-target effects of CRISPR. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail of what this um, exactly is, um, but they're looking at two potential off-targets here, for example, um, and then they come up with, with a score at the end um, that that score or the aggregate score is gonna give you a model of um, whether this, this could have off-target effects or, or not. Um, and CRISPR can actually have a lot of off-target effects and uh, you might introduce a mutation somewhere that you didn't actually want to. Uh, so this is a pretty good um, way of trying to figure that out before you actually do the CRISPR um, uh, genome editing. Um, so quickly, I'm just gonna review some challenges that exist within, um, within AI in genetics. Um, so I've talked a little bit about uh, basically a lot of the things I've, I've presented today are, are research-based. There's very few that are currently being used in clinical medicine, uh, but a lot of the other ones need a lot of clinical validation before they can even be used in clinical medicine. Uh, so that's one of the challenges. Um, there's narrow versus general AI. There's a lot of, uh, there, there are a lot of researchers that are trying to work on AGI or uh, artificial general intelligence, um, basically something that can completely simulate a human um, they, they have not been successful so far. And so we have these narrow um, AI systems or algorithms that are basically just doing one specific task where we have a bunch of them together um, in a pipeline, like what the RADIES algorithm was, as I was showing before. Uh, there's a lot of differences in computing infrastructure in different settings. So there are some settings that don't have enough computer infrastructure, computing infrastructures to actually do some of these uh, testing and, and, and training. Um, so that, that's, that's a challenge. Data sharing um, is, is a challenge between a lot of these uh, settings um, because of those computing infrastructure differences and also because of different regulations. Uh, computation and storage of big data is a challenge because we need a lot of uh, large amounts of data uh, from AI algorithms. And also we have some genetic diseases that are really rare or polygenic or multiple monogenic forms and stuff like that. So that's, that's, that makes it a little bit challenging as well. Um, as I said, regulations are a bit of a challenge. There's a lot of ambiguity in some of these regulations. Um, there's also, it's, it's also important where you source um, your, your training data, data set from. Um, so privacy, security of that training data is important. Um, and then some of these algorithms actually learn as they go. So they, once you are, you're actually using and testing the algorithm, they are learning from whatever you're doing at, at the same time. So the regulations for that might actually change. And so that's an issue and, and a challenge as well. Explainability and transparency of these algorithms is important. Um, and not a lot of AI algorithms are actually as explainable to the general public or at least the expert, like the physician who is, who is gonna be using it. Reproducibility and auditability are important. Um, and, and some companies do uh, proprietary softwares versus open source. Most of the um, algorithms I've actually presented today um, are open source. So that's, that makes it a little bit easier to go back and look at what exactly is being done or, or change it depending on your, um, whatever you're, you're trying to use for. But obviously, still there exists some, some companies that do proprietary um, software. And there's measures of accuracy. So note that I didn't really talk about the differences between accuracy of different um, methods or algorithms that have been used for, let's say, variant calling at the same time, um, mostly because the measures of accuracy they've used are different. Um, so one of them would use J-index, the other one would use the uh, area under the curve. Um, and these are different. So it, it, it makes it really challenging to compare and contrast between different algorithms. And then one last challenge that I wanna talk about is bias. So the face to gene app that I was just talking about that looks at the face and, and basically gives you a set of, uh, of diagnoses. Um, so one thing it does is important to the, to the accuracy point that I just talked about um, is that they mentioned that it's, uh, it's accurate 90% of the time. The issue with that is that it's uh, basically what they mean is the actual diagnosis is in the list of top, top diagnoses the app gives you 90% of the time. But 
it's only the first, the, 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 the top diagnosis is the actual diagnosis only 65% of the time. So that, that's, that's the issue with, with using different accuracy measurements um, to actually look at that. But one major uh, issue with, with actually phase two gene and deep gestalt, which is the, um, the deep learning, deep neural network um, that's behind the, behind the app um, is that there's a lot of bias. So when they um, imported, when they actually gave, gave a Down syndrome um, um, phenotype, or rather an image of a, of a, of a, of a patient with Down syndrome, um, it could tell you that this patient has Down syndrome 80% of the time if the patient is a white Belgian kid. Um, if the patient was a black Congolese child, uh, it was, that number was down to 36.8%. That's a very low number. That, that shows how much bias is in, in the training data set that has been used for this. Um, so we actually need to do a little bit better in terms of sourcing, sourcing our data and where we get the data and how diverse our data sets are that we use for training. So that kind of brings me to, to this big network um, that also is from the PhD Foundation um, report. I'm not going to go through all of this, but basically saying that these are some of the um, ways we can try and mitigate some of those challenges that we've seen that I've, that I've also talked about as well. So trying to um, potentially monitoring and addressing sources of bias, basically promoting explainable AI and algorithmic interpretability, um, like for example, building trust and demonstrating trustworthiness from in, in like within, within patients and like and physicians alike, for example. Managing hype is an important thing that it was actually interesting that they've included here, which is um, the, a lot of people have this idea that AI is just gonna solve everything um, with, with the data we have right now, and that's not really true. So we need to be a little bit more realistic and manage the hype that we have with it as well. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is a general um, framework of some of the things that we can actually do to make um, some of those challenges uh, a little bit more bearable or actually address them somehow. Um, and with that, I believe we're going to be posting these slides on the website, so you can actually look at the list of this further reading um, that I have here. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over time here, um, but I'm happy uh, to answer any questions you might have. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here and for listening.